So I'm gonna re-go back to our goal here of preventing gene flow, okay? Um, because all of those barriers that I just talked about and the different types of speciations that I'll mention in a second have this same singular goal of preventing gene flow uh, between populations and that's how we get these different species. Because if you think about it, right? And I can use this picture as an example. This is a really, really great example of speciation, specifically sympatric speciation, okay? Where flies are basically trained um, or yeah, trained on two different mediums, two different foods that they're eating. Uh, one group of flies is eating maltose and the other is eating starch, so different carbohydrate sources. Okay, And um, scientists actually keep them in captivity with their separate food sources. And after several generations, they bring them back together and they won't mate anymore, Okay, which is pretty crazy, um, just based off of, of the food source. So it must be some sort of smell or something that the, the flies are emanating based on their food source that's keeping um, keeping the maltose-eating flies with the maltose-eating flies and the starch-eating flies with the starch-eating flies. Um, so the big thing that happened there is that there was some sort of like probably chemical reaction that's keeping the same species together and um, and some separated, okay? Um, but when we talk about allopatric and sympatric speciation in a second, I want you to think about how they're preventing gene flow amongst populations, right? Because if you think about it, so if you look at the left-hand side, when we just first divided these flies into our starch medium and our maltose medium, they're still the same species there, right? If we put them back together right now, they would be capable of surviving and reproducing, okay? So it actually takes some time having them with separate environments or separate gene pools where they're just able to survive and reproduce on their two separate areas um, before we can bring them back and actually have them not be able to reproduce. Okay? Otherwise, they're just going to go right back to ground zero and we would basically be sitting with our initial sample of fruit flies. Um, but the second you have you know, different adaptations over here and different adaptations over here and they come back and they reproduce, you're going to see that mixing of traits again. Okay? So got to stop that gene. Got to stop that reproduction, hence the reproductive isolation. So those barriers exist between species, right? When two things are considered different species, we have all of these different barriers that are making sure that things don't reproduce, okay? But when we are working towards speciation, there are two major types of ways in which we can get new species. Um, and those two words are allopatric and sympatric speciation. Okay, so allopatric means away, okay, away, allopatric. So these two groups uh, of populations are going to be separated, right? A population forms a new species um, while they're geographically isolated from a parent population. So on the left-hand side, you see this fish, uh, this fish pond, I suppose, uh, has some sort of barrier in between it. I'm going to show you another example of that in a second. And because of that, uh, the fish on the left and the fish on the right are able to evolve separately in their own environments with their own environmental pressures and perhaps their own food sources, et cetera. And because they're not interbreeding at all, the next time that we they would see each other, they would be incapable of reproducing and successfully separate species. On the right-hand side, we have sympatric, and you can think sympatric same speciation, where we have a subset of a population forming new species without geographic separation. Okay, so there, these fish are still able to mingle with each other, okay, but somehow, some way, and this is going to be more challenging if you think about it, because they're all bumping into each other. It's like bumping into an X, right? Um, somehow, some way, we have to isolate these guys reproductively and cut off the gene flow between the two populations in order to successfully get two new species out of a group that's just chilling together. Right, so I'll tell you a couple different ways that we can actually prevent gene flow or stop gene flow uh, in sympatric populations. Um, so, allopatric on the left, you see a river has formed uh, between this forest, and therefore we have two groupings of trees that are not near one another, so their pollen probably cannot spread. Uh, remember that pollen is just plant sperm, so if you're allergic to plants, you're just allergic to their sperm. Um, and if the sperm is not capable of really fertilizing the plants nearby, we might see speciation that way. On the right-hand side, those guys have actually stayed in uh, the same general area, but we see that new species of trees creeping up in the middle. Uh, and again, in a little bit, I'll tell you about different ways that we can divide up the population um, that would allow for that to occur. Okay. 
Real life example of allopatric speciation. I believe I have two on here for you. Um, but the Isthmus of Panama, you may have heard of. It's a divider uh, that arose about 3.5 million years ago between North and South America. Okay? It's a connection between the two. And we have these two pork fish, the, Pan the Panamic pork fish and just the pork fish, pork fish, who knew there was such a thing, that live on either side of that, okay? So again, they probably had a, a recent common ancestor. At one point, they were the same species, but when that isthmus, which was basically just a stretch of land that divided uh, the Caribbean Sea, came and formed, those two groups separated themselves uh, reproductively and went on to evolve separately their separate ways. So you can look at these fish and kind of see the similarities in the heads and the stripes, um, but there's some sort of benefit to the panamic pork fish being kind of a brighter green. Perhaps the environment that they're living in has a lot more um, greenery or something along those lines, whereas the pork fish has a bunch of different colors. Perhaps they're mimicking another species in their side of the sea um, so that enemies don't, don't eat them. Uh, could be any number of reasons, but there's definitely rationale behind why these guys have evolved to look a little bit different over the years. All right. Sympatric, a really, really common example of sympatric speciation, and this is going to be, Sue, another example of habitat isolation, is with um, apple maggot flies, which just sounds really appetizing, okay? And basically, what happened uh, with these with these apple maggot flies is exactly what Sue just said. They're adapting to different ecological niches. So what is a niche? So a niche is going to be um, a location or kind of a, a a, an organism's role in its ecosystem, right? So what it eats, where it lives, who eats it, all of those things, like its role in the food web, um, if it's a pollinator, like all of those things that would contribute or have effects on its ecosystem, um, that's going to be its niche. So basically, in this case, these apple maggot flies, we have new trees brought in. So we have apple trees and then hawthorn trees brought in, I believe, by European settlers and planted. Um, and they have different fruits. So hawthorns are going to have a more bitter apple taste, more like a crab apple, um, as opposed to just the regular apple that you see um, in the middle on the top there. And these different flies, just they, these flies in this population just adapted to one or the other fruit. Um, and then gene flow was reduced between them because the, the apple maggot flies that produced, preferred the apples were only on apple trees. And the apple maggot flies that preferred the hawthorns were on the hawthorn trees, and then they're just not mating with one another, right? Flies don't have a very big ecosystem. They're pretty much just gonna chill in the tree that they're eating from. So they're kind of, their circle of friends are the ones that also enjoy apples or also enjoy hawthorns. Uh, and therefore, even though that's still the same population, right? That's still the same area, still the same location, they are picking different habitats or different niches within that population or that ecosystem. Um, and therefore, that's what's preventing gene flow there. Okay, so that's a big way that we can see that occurring. All right, so back to, I wanna talk about the three different ways, the three major ways um, that we can decrease gene flow and sympatric speciation. Okay, so habitat differentiation is what I just talked about. They're picking different habitats um, within the same general area, okay? So whether it's picking different, different apples to eat, um, in a minute I'm going to show you an example with lizards, um, and they are occupying different parts of a tree, so that we have like canopy lizards all the way up at the top, versus lizards that are living on, on like twig-like branches, versus lizards that prefer the trunk and ground. There's a really, really good HHMI bioinformatic uh, about that that I can certainly send along to you guys if you're interested. Um, it's really, really helpful for habitat differentiation. That is definitely one way, right? If they're occupying a different location within one general area, then they're not going to bump into each other and they're not going to have that gene flow. So that's one good way to decrease gene flow. Another major way to decrease gene flow within one single area, because again, that's what sympatric speciation is, is sexual selection. Um, so this is where females choose males based on their appearance, okay? The females are the choosy ones. So um, like if you think about it, our male species in, in the world are usually much more glamorous than the female species, right? Like cardinals, only the male cardinals are the red ones, the brilliant red ones that we see. Um, females are kind of like a brownish color. 
Um, and that's because they're trying to attract a mate. Same with peacocks. That's the male peacocks that have the beautiful tails. Female peacocks are like brown without a very long tail. Lions, if you think about their mane, all of those are sexual selection preferences. So if you're living, if organisms are living in the same environment and some just prefer um, one sort of species over another, that would be a good example of sexual selection. And then the last one's going to be polyploidy. And I have a diagram to show you with this one. This is kind of a funky one. It's common um, in plants, but basically it's going to be um, because of an error in os um, osmosis, not osmosis, meiosis, that's going to lead to different chromosomes. All right, so habitat differentiation, okay, especially if you're not real sure about speciation. Um, but you can see all the way at the top, we have these really, really, really big lizards that are living up on the, the crown of the tree versus uh, lizards that are much smaller living on the trunk and the twigs um, and then in the grass and the bushes. So they have evolved separately because they are evolving to a certain location in these massive, massive trees uh, all throughout like Puerto Rico and Jamaica and Cuba. All right, <laughs> this is my really oversimplified example of sexual selection. We got dinosaurs and the blue dinosaurs are preferring to mate with the blue dinosaurs and the green dinosaurs are preferring to mate with the green dinosaurs. And therefore over time, if their gene flow kind of stops between them, if all blue dinosaurs are keeping their genes within the blue dinosaurs and greens within the greens, you can actually see sympatric speciation occur and those two populations will become so separate that they're no longer capable of surviving and reproducing if they had to. Polyploidy, okay, so this all has to do with chromosome numbers. So instead of having, so haploid and diploid, important things to know. So haploid means half the number of, of um, chromosomes and diploid would mean double, right? So with haploid, like our haploid number would be 23. So sperm and egg cells all have 23 chromosomes in them. Whereas uh, obviously the rest of our cells, all of our body cells, our somatic cells have 46, right? Which would be double that. What can happen here is during, um, during meiosis, we can actually have some unseparated chromosomes or something can go wrong. And we can actually have like a triploid or a tetraploid offspring where there's some sort of self-fertilization and the chromosomes aren't separating and we have double the amount of DNA than we should, okay? So it's basically be like two of our body cells combining together as opposed to like an egg and a sperm cell coming together. And that can cause, um, that can cause problems. Like if it happened in humans, we would just die. Um, but what this happens in kind of frequently is actually plants, um, and they can survive just fine because they can self-fertilize, right? So they can they can actually exist with a weird number of chromosomes. But basically, what happens is um, they are self-fertilizing then because they're incapable. If you're tetraploid, you then can't mate with something that is diploid, right? So if all of the parent plant species are diploid and this offspring that's produced by an accident is tetraploid, it would be incapable of reducing of reproducing immediately with any of the parental gener uh, generations and therefore it would have formed its own species, okay? Thankfully, plants can self-fertilize and so this, this species could actually propagate um, and grow and develop more plants um, just by that. And then they could obviously sexually reproduce once there was more than one of them. Okay. So that's a funky one. Uh, it is an important one though, really, really important. And it, it has to do with why we have so many different species of plants. So, so far we have talked about pre and post zygotic barriers, right? One happening before fertilization and one happening after fertilization, but both are reproductive barriers that are preventing different species from mating. We've talked about allopatric and sympatric speciation, right? So with that, we're talking about how um, species can arise either due to geographical barrier and being geographically isolated from one another, which is going to make it easier to stop gene flow, making allopatric speciation actually more common versus sympatric speciation. Through a couple different mechanisms, we can decrease gene flow there, but it's going to be more difficult because mating between um, organisms before speciation has completed is just going to be way more common because they're in the same area. Okay. And lastly, another big keyword that has to do with macroevolution is going to be adaptive radiation. 